guilty verdict. Officer Derek Chauvin faces decades behind bars for the death of George Floyd. Capitol Hill reaction. How some lawmakers want to change police practices. Coronavirus crisis. President Joe Biden celebrates 200 million shots in arms. What he wants employers to do next. And aid to the church in need. A closer look at religious freedom across the world. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. Unintentional second degree murder, third degree murder, second degree manslaughter, guilty, guilty, guilty. After three weeks of testimony, the trial of the former police officer charged with killing George Floyd ended swiftly and Derek Chauvin was handcuffed and taken away to prison. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. Our comprehensive coverage includes official reaction from Washington. We will also explore Catholic responses. But first, the U.S. Attorney General has already announced a new Justice Department probe into the Minneapolis Police Department. The investigation I am announcing today will assess whether the Minneapolis Police Department engages in a pattern or practice of using excessive force including during protests. Last night, Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz quoted his state's attorney general who said that the verdict isn't justice, it's just one step towards it. Meanwhile, Americans across the nation share their reactions to the outcome of the trial. I think it'll make people more aware, especially police officers, more aware that there are people out there, we're watching you. We're videotaping things just because this has happened so many times. Get a little bit. A teacher in Cambridge, Massachusetts, says the verdict should be seen as truth against injustice, intolerance, and racism. Three other officers are facing charges in George Floyd's death. Toe Tao, Thomas Lane, and Jay Alexander Kang are expected to be tried together in August. They are all charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder and aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter. The head of the Archdiocese of St. Paul and Minneapolis is calling for peace, reconciliation, and a greater respect for human life after the verdict was read. Archbishop Bernard Hebda writes in part, the verdict is a sobering moment for our community. The Archbishop continues asking Jesus, quote, to bring healing into our communities, comfort to the family of George Floyd and all who mourn, and satisfaction to those who thirst for justice. Joining us now is Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, co-host of EWTN's God's Blueprint for a Happy Life. Deacon Harold, welcome back. Always so great to see you. Uh, first off, I'd like to get your thoughts on the guilty verdict. How do you think people of faith should respond? Well, the first thing we need to do always uh, is to pray for the families. Pray for the families of uh, George Floyd and of uh, Mr. Chauvin as well. This has been an extremely difficult, heartbreaking situation that never should have happened in the first place. The jury uh, looked at all the evidence. Uh, they weighed it in light of the presentation by the prosecution and the defense. And uh, using the rule of law, uh, they, they rendered their decision. And, and that's something we have to, to stand by. Um, I totally agree with the bishops of Minnesota uh, that we should use this decision as a way of remembering that we have to look at the dignity of the human person in every single human being made in the image and likeness of God, that we're all children of God. We need to recognize that in each other. Well, there have been calls uh, for police reform, as you know, and I also know that you spent uh, more than 20 years in law enforcement. From your perspective, what, if anything, do you think needs to be done? Well, I will be the first one to say that there definitely needs to be reform. And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, for six years in my career, I had the great honor and privilege of serving on the board of the Department, Public, of Department of Public Safety Standards and Training for the state of Oregon. That's the agency that provides training and resources for public safety officers throughout the entire state. And uh, so I'm intimately familiar with how police officers are trained. 
Um, so, so what happens is this. The training they receive is excellent. What they don't identify within that training are biases. So, for example, they use the typical psychological screening tool is the MMPI, the uh, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. What that inventory doesn't look for is bias. So you have an officer that comes in with a preconceived prejudice or bias in his head. I don't like black people or Hispanic people or white people or Asian people. You give this officer a, a skill set, the tools that he needs to keep himself and those that he's sworn to protect safe. But now this officer is exercising that duty uh, with these preconceived biases in his head. See, and, and what that looks like is systemic racism, but it's actually not. We got to be careful throwing around that term systemic racism. So what you would have to say is, is that police agencies, by their very nature, the way they operate, in their, in their processes, procedures, and methods, either written or unwritten, as an entire body, are saying, I believe that my race is superior to this other person's race, therefore I would treat them differently. That's very different than an, than an individual within the system who has prejudice or bias and is exercising that in their functions and duties. Uh, before I let you go, uh, Deacon, I do want to ask you this. I mean, it's been a really tough time uh, over the past year or so, but how can we move forward? How can we all, you know, come together and start to heal as a nation? Yes, uh, I think it goes back to the scriptures. I think it goes back to the Good Samaritan. Um, you know, the, the, the Samaritan was, uh, the, the Jewish person was at the side of the road. He was passed by that people, that by people that looked like him. But it was the Samaritan, the stranger, the one that was supposed to be hated. He was the one who had pity and mercy on the person and treated them with dignity and respect. And it's easy to, to look back in retrospect and say, I would do the same thing. But what if that person laying on the side of the road was Officer Chauvin? What if that person on the side of the road was a person who molested you or raped you or drove drunk and killed your spouse? It, you know, the anger and the hatred we feel would burn like a fire. But we have to remember the words of Jesus. We must forgive. The Samaritan calls us to a new standard of holiness uh, where we exclude no one on the grounds of, of race or prejudice. And so we must be the Samaritan. Absolutely. We must forgive. Thank you so much, Deacon Harold. We really appreciate you coming on and speaking with us today. Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, co-host of EWTN's God's Blueprint for a Happy Life. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Our President Joe Biden says systemic racism is a stain on our nation's soul. He is urging Congress to act on meaningful police reform while recognizing that most police officers serve their communities honorably. We have team coverage now and begin with White House correspondent Owen Jensen. Owen. Tracy, the president wants the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act to happen. Vice President Kamala Harris helped write it and he wants to sign it into law. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Those are George Floyd's last words. President Joe Biden remembering George Floyd and calling for change. We can't stop here. In order to deliver real change and reform, we can and we must do more to reduce the likelihood that tragedies like this will ever happen and occur again. And Vice President Kamala Harris said the system needs to be reformed. America has a long history of systemic racism. Black Americans and black men in particular have been treated throughout the course of our history as less than human. The White House is also making new announcements on the coronavirus vaccine front. President Joe Biden says this week he'll meet the goal of administering 200 million shots. While more than 50 percent of adults are at least partially vaccinated, millions of Americans have yet to receive the shot. To put it simply, if you've been waiting for your turn, wait no longer. Now is the time for everyone over 16 years of age to get vaccinated. The president says in the effort to get more Americans vaccinated, small businesses and nonprofits whose employees have to take a day off to get vaccinated or need a few days off to rest can now be reimbursed full cost. It's called a paid leave tax credit. 
under the American Rescue Plan. No working American should lose a single dollar from their paycheck because they chose to fulfill their patriotic duty of getting vaccinated. Now back to the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. Today, the White House press secretary told reporters in the briefing room that the president believes the bar for convicting officers is far too high and needs to be changed. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Reaction of the guilty verdict echoed in the halls of Congress on Capitol Hill. Democrats continue to say this verdict is just the beginning and renewed efforts to pass police reform. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. In the past, Congress has taken up police reform legislation, but disagreements over certain provisions have led these measures to stall. Now, a renewed effort is underway. Justice, true justice will not come until we finally banish the ancient poison of racism from the American soul. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer promises the Senate will pass police reform soon. The Senate will continue to work that work as we strive to ensure that George Floyd's tragic death will not be in vain. Republican South Carolina Senator Tim Scott said in a statement, quote, there is no question in my mind that jury reached the right verdict. He went on to say, while this outcome should give us renewed confidence in the integrity of our justice system, we know that there is more work to be done to ensure the bad apples do not define all officers. Other Republicans say the comments by Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who told protesters to, quote, stay on the street and get more confrontational if they don't see a guilty verdict returned, should never happen. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy tried to censure Representative Waters for the comments, but the House Democrats voted to table the issue, essentially defeating it. Senator Lindsey Graham says he's in for moving forward on police reform. Tim Scott had a good bill. Yes. Yeah, I don't mind trying to engage in reasonable police reform. Uh, uh, but yeah, in terms of the uh, legal system, I think it would work. While others believe police reform needs to stay on the state level. Most of the issues are in big cities that are run by blue administrations and unions. Uh, and um, I think there's a lot of soul searching that needs to be done there. Democrats plan to bring more police reform legislation to the floor very soon. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, District of Columbia, the politics behind the push to make D.C. a state. And hail to the queen, why England's monarch is using her birthday to thank others. Earlier this week, the Biden administration formally announced its support for making Washington, D.C. a state. In a statement, the White House said in part, quote, establishing the state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth as the 51st state will make our union stronger and more just. But not everyone believes it is a good idea. Joining us now is Zach Smith, legal fellow at the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Zach, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Uh, first off, as you know, the House of Representatives is expected to vote tomorrow on D.C. statehood. What do you expect to happen there? And, and why do you think this push is coming now and so quickly? Well, I certainly think this push is coming now so quickly because it certainly seems to be for partisan advantage. Uh, you know, there are two potentially Democratic uh, senators up for grabs if D.C. becomes a state. And I think, unfortunately, you'll see this bill pass along an almost party line vote in the House of Representatives tomorrow. And again, that's unfortunate given the grave constitutional concerns with the District of Columbia becoming a state in this manner. I also uh, I w want to talk to you about the Biden administration, you know, backing this D.C. statehood. And also interesting, the change in name from District of Columbia to Douglas Commonwealth. What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, again, you know, I'm disappointed that President Biden is supporting uh, this push for D.C. statehood by simple mm -hmm. legislation. Historically, this has been a bipartisan consensus. Both Republican and Democratic Justice Departments that have looked at the issue have agreed that in order for the District of Columbia to become our nation's 51st state, a constitutional amendment would be needed. Uh, and so to see uh, the president, uh, members of the House, many members of the Senate on the Democratic side, uh, supporting uh, the District of Columbia becoming a state by simple legislation, uh, it's very disappointing. Uh, and as you mentioned, the name of the new state would be State of Washington and Douglas Commonwealth, uh, so that the bulk of the current district could become our nation's 51st state, with the District of Columbia, the seat of our federal government, essentially being shrunk to a very small area encompassing the Capitol building, the White House, the National Mall, and just a few other buildings, uh, which is something that, that frankly was not envisioned by our founding fathers. Zach, what's the danger in making D.C. a state, and also how would that impact the country overall? Well, I think our founding fathers certainly never envisioned the District of Columbia becoming a state. They wanted an independent federal district free from the influence or control of any one state uh, so that the federal government could maintain the safety and security of the federal district and also be free of undue influence from state authorities in running the day-to-day -day business of the federal government. And the danger to our country is really that this uh, transforming the District of Columbia into our nation's 51st state would really upset the fundamental balance of our federal system of government. Not only would it add two new senators to the United States Senate, but again, it would undermine the very purpose for which the Founding Fathers uh, established the District of Columbia in that it would essentially allow this new state, the Douglas Commonwealth, to exercise an outsized influence over our federal government. Zach, we only have about 30 seconds left, but quickly, how do you think this is all going to play out? Well, it's certainly going to pass the House of Representatives. Uh, the big holdup, like last time, will happen in the Senate. So far, there are four Democratic caucusing senators that have not signed on to co-sponsor this bill. I hope it remains that way and that they recognize the dangers of the District of Columbia becoming our nation's 51st state by simple legislation. It was something the Founding Fathers never intended, and a constitutional amendment is needed in order to radically transform the size and status of the district. And we will see what happens. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Zach Smith, Legal Fellow at the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you again. Of course. Thank you for having me on. Up next, Religious Freedom Report. Aid to the Church in Need reveals the extent of the problem. And the power of prayer. Pope Francis offers advice on how to better connect with God. An ecumenical prayer service in Sri Lanka marks the deadly Easter Sunday bombings of 2019. Archbishop Cardinal Malcolm Ranjith asked Muslims to reject extremism. An Islamic cleric said Islam offers no justification for the crime. Two local groups pledged to ISIS are blamed for multiple attacks that killed 269 people. To date, there have been no arrests in connection with the bombings. A new report examines religious persecution around the world, and it has some troubling findings. 67 percent of the world's population live in countries where religious freedom is being violated. That is according to Aid to the Church in Need's annual report on countries experiencing discrimination. Nine African countries appeared on the list for the first time, showing an increase in extreme persecution in the continent. Joining us now with more insight is Marcella Shemansky, editor-in-chief of Aid to the Church in Need's 2021 Religious Freedom Report. She is also their advocacy officer at the European Union and 
the United Nations. Marcella, welcome back. Always so good to see you. Um, in this year's report, can you talk to us about what's new and also what stayed the same? Well, one of the main uh, findings that we have is that we are surprised to find that there are a total of 62 countries identified having strong violations to the fundamental right to freedom of religion. So in these countries, there are close to 5.2 billion people. So we believe that it is intolerable that two-thirds of the people on the planet cannot confidently live according to their faith and personal convictions. Also, we were shocked to discover the consolidation of the Islamic State, which traveled to Africa, revealing that they recovered what they had lost in Syria and Iraq, which is new members, huge resources, and more importantly, territory. In Mozambique, in the last two months, they took two ports, and they now control the access to a large natural gas processing center. That is really one of the main findings. What remained the same? It looks alarmingly similar. This, the map that we make with the worst offenders, it looks like all the other human rights offenders in the world. However, we have a real regret to say that everybody who was doing bad is now doing worse. So we definitely need to do something about it. Marcel, I also understand the report uh, also references the dangers of artificial intelligence and mass surveillance. Uh, what more can you tell us about that? Yeah, the artificial intelligence applications that we so joyfully accept from our smartphones and Alexa are used in China and other authoritarian states that have bought the technology, and now they are being used to control the spiritual choices of their citizens. They have an, an electronic cards system that rewards people for going to church less often or to their temple less often. For example, they get rewards like better prices on trains and flights. So this way, they have found a most perverse way to drag people out of their source of hope and their religion. This technology is being bought even in places in Latin America right now. Oh, my goodness. Well, I also know that Pope Francis has described a rise of polite persecution uh, in Western countries. What do you think he means by that? Yeah, this is occurring mostly in Western countries, but also in countries in the, in the entire Americas, we will regret to say. We have heard the Pope referring to new laws that cut out the freedom of the believers almost without noticing. Mostly, this is by discriminating in favor of the non-believers. This reveals that more governments in the West ignore their own international engagement with the 18 international human rights treaties, all derived from the UN Declaration of Human Rights. They attempt to make hierarchies of human rights to say this one is higher up, this one is lower, this one can disappear, etc., which is totally not, uh, unacceptable because these are individual hu human rights to which they subscribe. And so the governments do not know anymore what it means to be secular and forget their obligation, the obligation to keep the public space open for all. They have to keep the public space open for those without religion and also for those without any religion. And that is what we have to always remain vigilant about. Well, Marcella, thank you so much for speaking with us today about this very important subject. We really appreciate it. Marcella Shemansky, Editor-in-Chief of Aid to the Church in Needs 2021 Religious Freedom Report. Thank you again. Thanks to you. Please. Pope Francis says vocal prayer is a sure way to speak with God. Jesus enseña una preghiera vocale, el Padre Nuestro. At the Holy Father's weekly talk in the Vatican, he says vocal prayer is not only about repeating words, but is a way to speak freely to God. He says sacred scriptures can teach us how to pray even with bold wor words. And when we feel confused or angry, we must learn to lift up our hearts to the Lord. Our Queen Elizabeth II is celebrating her 95th birthday today. One royal biographer says the queen is balancing today's joy while mourning her late husband. She will be coping with this in her own way, but this is not to underestimate the grief that she will be feeling. A statement expresses gratitude for messages of support and kindness after the recent passing of Prince Philip. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.